Letitia James's horrible attorney general in New York campaigned on, I will get Trump, I will get Trump. We went through a trial. It turned out we're totally innocent on everything. And he fined me $355 million plus interest and other things. But they say it's the most egregious punishment anybody's ever seen. Tim Scott knows that. He sees it. The Eighth Amendment. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. That's the Eighth Amendment. Excessive fines. If he does not have funds uh, to pay off the judgment, uh, then we will seek, uh, you know, judgment enforcement mechanisms in court, and we will ask the judge to seize his assets. Former President Trump railing against the civil fraud ruling during last night's town hall here on Fox as New York State Attorney General Letitia James threatens to seize his assets if he doesn't pay up. Here to react is Fox News contributor and GW Law School professor Jonathan Turley. Good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. He uses a great case. I mean, the Eighth Amendment, he says fines shouldn't be excessive. This is $450 million with uh, interest. Cruel shouldn't be unusual punishment. That can't be afflicted or inflicted. Does he have a good case here? Well, he has certainly a good case about the excessiveness of this judgment, whether it's under the Eighth Amendment or due process clause, uh, we'll have to see. The Supreme Court rarely gets into these issues. There have been some cases. For example, there was a case involving BMW with the imposition of punitive damages. Uh, what's interesting in this case is that James is going to argue this isn't like punitive damages. This is disgorgement. We were simply taking the money, the ill-gotten gains back from him. But but when you drill down on this opinion, there's nothing there. I mean, you can't really figure out how he came to this figure uh, based on any real hard numbers. He basically highballs everything that uh, he's calculating. And then he has a lot of speculation. He says things like, you know, if, if you had been honest with the banks, they would have required higher interest rates and you would have had a good, a good of a deal. Well, the Trump corporation was famous for squeezing banks because they wanted his business. And they said that on the stand in front of this judge. They said, we made money. We wanted more loans with this, what they called a whale client. You know, you mentioned BMW. I understand a company having to pay out this kind of money, but have you ever heard a penalty for an individual this large? No, but also the statute hasn't been used in this way against an individual where there wasn't a crime, the company didn't go bankrupt, the loans were paid off, everyone made money. Uh, even the New York Times couldn't find in decades a case that really looked like this one. That's and that's not too surprising. You have an attorney general who ran on the pledge to bag him for something. So it's and not And this fraud, was the something right? she came up with. So it's not fraud if everyone made money. Um, I, well, the argument of the court is it was still fraud, even though you didn't cost anyone a dollar. Uh, even if you accept that, because overvaluing, undervaluing property okay. is very common in the real estate area. But even if you accept that this is fraudulent, the question is why this nuclear option? Why this is an effective public execution? And the glee that people are expressing right. uh, that he might have a fire sale of his properties really shows the discomfort that many of us have uh, with this opinion. Oh, yeah. Democrats love this. They're cheering. I, I heard someone say they were at a bar when this ruling came down, and the whole bar started cheering. They were at an Ivy League university. Um, today, Republicans are interviewing Joe Biden's brother. Now, the purpose here is to see if the president made money from his brother and from his son, Hunter, and they're questioning about this $200 check, this payment to Joe Biden. How does he explain that? Well, the important thing is he's going to have to explain it. For those of us who've been writing about the Bidens for years, I've actually been writing about the influence peddling with the Biden family for over a decade. Um, this is an amazing moment because the Bidens have never been called to account. They've never been forced to yeah. go under oath and answer these questions. And th this deal really sort of captures James Biden's business. He would openly discuss uh, leveraging his brother's connection 
connections in order to get business. Yeah. And this was a company that left a lot of people holding the bag, but not the Bidens. They got a lot of money before this business collapsed. I know. We have a lot of questions. Jonathan, I want to get to this topic before we run out of time. There are photos. Uh, Hunter's attorneys have submitted some filings. This happened yesterday. There are photos that show what look like lines of cocaine from Hunter Biden. But Hunter's <laughs> attorneys are now saying, if you look at that photo right there, that's actually sawdust. It was taken by a carpenter who sent this picture to Dr. Keith Ablo, who was then Biden's psychiatrist, to illustrate that the carpenter had overcome his addiction. Are you buying that? Well, the, the reason I, I don't buy the overall argument is it, it ignores the other photos, right, of drug paraphernalia. It ignores that they found the pouch that contained his gun covered in cocaine. Now, that wasn't from some arts and craft course. That, that was real cocaine on the gun. Okay, so I don't know what they hope to achieve, uh, but this isn't going to get them where they need to go. And he wrote about it in his book as well, his drug addiction problem. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for coming on. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Steve Ducey. I'm Brian Kilme. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. And click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis.